So before we start, let's bow our heads and we'll ask our, our Saviour to be with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promise that you have given us that where two or three are gathered together, you will be present there with us. And there are many more than two or three this morning. And so we claim that promise that your presence will be with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask that you will uh, work on the words that I will present, that they will be ones that will be relevant, helpful and uplifting to all who are listening. I pray this morning. Amen. The second last enemy. Now, we've all heard about the last enemy, I guess. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And that comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 26. And that's a wonderful promise because it tells us that for the faithful, death will not be the end. The death will actually be destroyed. But that is in the future. That's not now. And so I thought, well, what's the second last enemy? This may seem like a little diversion, but that's what I used to do. And uh, it's quite a little while now since I've been doing such things. In fact, this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> that's not me, but... <laughs> And what's that meant to tell me? That's meant to tell me that we need to accept whatever God calls us to do and we need to do it humbly. And sometimes that means taking a step down, even a big step down, and accepting that there are things that we no longer do, but God is calling us to do something else. But let's get back to the intent of putting this slide up. About 20 years ago, a little bit more I think, not much distant from this particular slide when it was taken, a lady came to see me who needed a reconstruction. And it was a microsurgical reconstruction, so that's a big deal. And so I explained to her what needed to be done and that this is an operation which could take six or eight hours. She seemed at the time to be a little bit taken aback by that, but we made the arrangements for her to be admitted to Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. And in those days, um, because the surgery would begin at 8 a.m. in the morning, um, and if the patient had come from a long way away, they would be admitted to hospital the night before. And so this lady came into hospital and was admitted to hospital the night before. And the next morning um, I arrived and was ready for the operating theatre and my registrar said, oh, we've got a problem. And I said, well, what would that be? And he said, well, I'm afraid that our patient is now in cardiac intensive care. <laughs> and I thought, oh, <laughs> I guess I'll be having the day off. <laughs> and so it turned out that the lady who had come into hospital and was facing this very daunting procedure that was going to last six to eight hours, during the night had become progressively more and more fearful. And she began to develop chest pain and shortness of breath. Now when that happens in a hospital, they sometimes have to press the panic button, but at least the cardiac team was called and they came to see her and they looked at her and they examined her and they put on electrocardiographs and they took some blood tests and so on and within a very short period of time they said well operations off she's going into cardiac intensive care now it took a few days for us to work out what had happened because most of us thought oh she's had a heart attack so you know she's going to be in in hospital for a while and this is very serious significant condition but after a few days the cardiology team came to us and said ah well actually it's a little bit better than you thought uh, because she hasn't really suffered a normal heart attack she's suffering from Takotsubo syndrome and I said what? 
Takotsubo, who's that? And they explained to us that Takotsubo was actually a Japanese cardiologist who, quite some years before, had described a syndrome which became known as the broken heart syndrome. And people who get into very, very severe, fearful situations, and it's more common in women than men, their, act, their heart actually begins to do some really weird things. Now, this is what's called a cardiac ventriculogram. And a cardiac ventriculogram is when they put a catheter up through your veins and into your heart and actually put dye through into the left ventricle. And it shows you how the heart works. So on the left side here, you will see a healthy heart working. As they squirt the dye in, you can see the heart fills up and squirts it out up into the aorta. And that's a normal heart. Okay, that's what it's meant to do. This is a Takotsubo heart. Whoa, that looks a bit different, doesn't it? It's got like a tight band in the middle of it and a little lump at the end, and it's very inefficient. And that's why these people get into trouble. So, that's how a normal heart should look if you put dye in it. And this is how a Takotsubo heart is. Now, why the term Takotsubo? What does that mean? Takotsubo is actually a description of an octopus pot. <laughs> Why the cardiologist knew about this, I don't know, but these are these octopus pots that the fishermen in Japan take out to catch octopuses because apparently that's a delicacy in Japan and they eat a lot of octopus. Um, and the end of the heart there that you can see is meant to look like an octopus pot and that's why it's called Takotsubo syndrome. But the take home message here is that this is a broken heart. And we can see in scripture and we can see just by common uh, use of the term, we know what a broken heart is. But a broken heart can actually lead to quite severe physical problems. Now in the end we are told in Luke 21, 26 that in the end times men's hearts will fail them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Fear. Fear is the second last enemy. But fear can be good. And fear can be bad. It depends on what type of fear we're talking about. And this one here, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The Hebrew word for that is yira, which means fear in both senses or reverence. Another term of fear in the New Testament saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. We all are very familiar with that text. And that word is the Greek word phobos, which also means fear or reverence, depending on the circumstance. In fact, in the Bible, in the King James Version, there are 400 words translated as fear. So it's a very commonly repeated term in the scripture. And there are quite a few different uh, Hebrew words and Greek words that are used for fear. Yare, for example, in, uh, in the Hebrew, or Yirah, which is derived from that word, and Mora, which is derived from Mara. Um, all of those words are Hebrew words for fear. And there are other Greek words which we've mentioned, such as Phobos. Where does fear come from? This is a good question. Where does fear originate? This is where fear comes from. It comes from your mind. That's where fear comes from. Now, I'll bring in a little bit of creation here because it's creation Sabbath. I would contend that the very pinnacle of God's creation on this earth was the human brain, the very pinnacle. The human himself and herself, humans, 
were certainly the apex of the creation, but what made them different from everyone else and every other creature was this thing up here. Between our ears, they say. The human brain. Now, um, I don't know if anybody else has said this, but I put this together, and this is a statement which I think is hard to say is not correct. There is no aspect of human civilization that did not first have its origin in a thought. There is no structure, no mechanical device, no artwork, no literature, no musical composition, no political system, no religion, no philosophy that did not hatch first in someone's mind. The big question is, whose mind? And we'll look into that a little bit. Some years ago, a book was written by a man called Paul Davies, who's a, um, a scientist, called The Mind of God. And it was an attempt to try to philosophize in terms of science um, about the existence or non-existence of God. On the other hand, a man called Napoleon Hill uh, has written this, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe it can achieve. Well, I don't know about that. There are still lots of things that we haven't yet achieved and there are some things we know we will not achieve. But nevertheless, knowing the mind of God has been a search of mankind, even very important people. This uh, photograph of Albert Einstein was taken in 1922. He was still a relatively young man. And he said this, I want to know God's thoughts. The rest are mere details. So here is one of the greatest minds of all time, if not the 20th century, uh, saying that he was interested in knowing what God's thoughts are. In fact, the scripture talks about God's thoughts. In Romans 11:34, it asks the question, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Now, this is a quote from the Old Testament that Paul is making, but who has known the mind of the Lord and who has become his counselor? In other words, was anybody above the Lord? No. And this is what God said to Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The mind of God is something that we would like to touch, but we'll never fully understand. Ellen White had this to say in Life Sketches, you cannot meet the mind of God unless you put to use every power. The mental faculties will strengthen and develop if you will go to work in the fear of God. In humility and with earnest prayer, a resolute purpose will accomplish wonders. So here she is saying you can approach the mind of God. You can know a little bit about the mind of God, but it requires very significant mental effort. Okay, stewardship. <laughs> Pastor Governor has been talking about stewardship and so I thought what we should talk about is the stewardship of the mind. Here's a little graphic. I'm including those T's that Pastor Governor was wanting to use. So there are three aspects of the mind that we're going to look into. The intellectual, the emotional, the spiritual, and all three come together to produce stability. We'll start with the intellectual. Job asked this question, who has put wisdom in the mind? Or who has given understanding to the heart? And Solomon said this, trust the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. So we're beginning to develop here 
a plan of knowing how to develop our intellectual powers. By not trusting on our own strength, by not trusting even on our own thoughts, but by trusting on the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. So that means that we need to know something of the mind of God and the thoughts of God if we are actually going to develop intellectual power. Through your precepts I get understanding, the psalmist said. And the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So there's no excuse for anyone, anyone who feels that they are simple. Sorry, but the Lord has said, you read his word and you will be given understanding. Ellen White also had this to say, to deal with minds is the greatest work ever committed to men. The time of, and she goes on to talk about the development of the mind through uh, the bringing up of children. The time of parents is too valuable to be spent in the gratification of appetite or the pursuit of wealth or fashion. God has placed in their hands the precious youth, not only to be fitted for a place of usefulness in this life, but to be prepared for the heavenly. So the mind has to develop from a very early age and has to be guided. The tempted one needs to understand the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision, of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. Desires for goodness and purity are right, as far as they go, but if we stop here, they avail nothing. Many will go down to ruin while hoping and desiring to overcome their evil propensities. You remember some of you who go back as far as I do remember that song, Wishing and Hoping? <laughs> well, wishing and hoping can only go so far. They do not yield the... Uh, um, many will go down to ruin while hoping and desiring to overcome their evil propensities. They do not yield the will to God. They do not choose to serve him. Everything depends on the right action of the will. It is our duty of every person, for his own sake and for the sake of humanity, to inform himself in regard to the laws of life and conscientiously to obey them. They should study the influence of the mind upon the body and of the body upon the mind and the laws by which they are governed. Now here we can begin to see this togetherness of mind and body. And as a denomination, we've been told a lot about that. And as a doctor, I've had a lot to do with that. And we've spoken about it. And we've been involved in talking about this in seminars and in health expos and so on. That it is very important that the body and the mind are together. One influences the other. And it works both ways. Now, what about the emotional side of the brain. Now, the, the things that we've been talking about, uh, the intellectual powers, they begin up here in the frontal lobe and in other parts of the main cortex of the brain. But the emotions come from a deeper level um, and are affected in different ways. They can be affected by hormones. They can be affected by a situation uh, that happens even like a reflex. So the emotions are a little bit different, but they have a profound effect on the rest of the brain. So, in Psalm 37, 8, it says, Do not fret, it only causes harm. Pretty short verse there. But it actually tells us something. That constant fretting affects us physically. It only causes harm. Some of the emotions that we experience sometimes are anger. In Ephesians 4.26 it says, be angry. <coughs> oh, hang on. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. So temporary anger in a way can be useful. You know, when Christ entered the temple to throw out um, those who are um, committing such uh, abomination within the temple, he was angry and righteously so. 
but he didn't let his anger um, last. And in Ephesians 4.1, it says, Let all bitterness... Now, bitterness comes from continued anger and uh, enmity uh, working onwards and onwards in your brain, and it gets to be very detrimental to your character and even physically. We must not develop or hang on to grudges. It will harm us. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour and evil speaking to be put away from you with all malice, Ephesians 4.1. Ellen White had to say this. This was a personal testimony written to a young woman uh, about emotional issues. Your only course is to give yourself unreservedly into the hands of Jesus. All your experiences, all your temptations, all your trials, all your impulses and let the Lord mould you as clay is moulded in the hands of the potter. You are not your own, and therefore there is the necessity of giving your unmanageable self into the hands of one who is able to manage you. Then rest, precious rest, and peace will come to your soul. And she had some more to say. This time she is looking at the effect of religion, of worship, has how it affects all parts of our mind. Religion ever imparts power to its possessor to restrain, control and balance the character and intellect and emotions. It has a power to persuade, entreat and command with divine authority all the ability and affections. Um, the, there was a book called The Sons and Daughters of God. Apparently they've now separated off into Daughters of God and maybe there's one Sons of God as well. <laughs> this one's for Daughters of God. And she had this to say about uh, popular types of religious revival are often carried by appeals to the imagination, by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling. Converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth, little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, it has no attractions for them. A message which appeals to unimpassioned reason awakens no response. The plain warnings of God's word relating directly to their eternal interests are unheeded. And that's from that well-known book, Great Controversy. And what about the spiritual? Well, Paul had this to say in Ephesians 4.23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So this is talking about a transforming power over the mind. And in Colossians he had this to say, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Philippians, in Philippians, he had this to say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The same motivations, the same love, the same compassion, all of these things that we read about began in Jesus' mind before they were enacted out. So here, Paul is saying, let this mind the way Jesus thought be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, which will then be acted out in your behaviour. And there was a warning, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay, so where does fear come in? Now I'm hoping that this one will come up with some sound. We'll see how it goes. There has been and have ever been fear campaigns. And I'm going to mention two. One of them is very, very recent and you would have all seen it on your television. On a hot September day, a warming planet dominates the agenda. We are the generation that will save this planet. One generation, the youngest, now leading others before it. 
demanding urgent action to curb carbon emissions, the so-called die-in staged to warn of what might happen otherwise. This is the group of people called Extinction Rebellion, who believe that the race will become extinct within a generation or two because of climate change. Now, if you go back 30 years or so, um, the planet was actually going to freeze. <laughs> um, and that's yet another um, fear campaign. In fact, there have been many fear campaigns. When I was 14 years old, I'd have to say that there was a fear, not so much a campaign, but a fear that was coming upon the Earth that was really a lot more dangerous than these ones. In 1962, late in the year, it was discovered by uh, spy planes flying over Cuba that the Soviet Union was installing intermediate range ballistic missiles in Cuba that would reach the American uh, whole continent within 20 minutes. It was in response to the fact that the US had actually put intermediate range missiles along the border uh, places in Europe that could reach Moscow in 15 or 20 minutes. So this was one of these cat and mouse tit for tat type of games. This was a very dangerous game. I can remember it well. Who of you can remember? Old enough. Yeah, there are a few who can remember that. For 13 days, the world teetered on the edge of nuclear annihilation. And many of us did not realise that it was actually a lot closer than we thought. These are some of the missiles that used to be paraded through the streets of Moscow. President Kennedy, Kennedy gave the Soviet Union an ultimatum, move them out of Cuba or else. And he put a naval blockade around Cuba. Sometime before, the Soviet Union had sent four nuclear submarines from the Arctic Circle down to the Caribbean. They reached the Caribbean area around about the time that this began. Those four nuclear submarines actually were nuclear, uh, they weren't nuclear submarines, beg your pardon, they were submarines, but they had on board each one a single nuclear torpedo with the same power as destroyed Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And they were detected by the US Navy. They had to dive and stay under the water for several days. Um, it got to the point where the crews were beginning to feel that they would run out of oxygen. Um, it was getting very hot because they were in the tropical area. And one of the captains of the, uh, and, and the US Navy began to drop um, warning charges. They weren't full power depth charges, they were charges that meant to say to the Soviet submarines, come up or else. And this is right in the middle of this crisis. One of the captains wanted to press the button and fire a nuclear torpedo at the US fleet that was above them. If that had happened, this would have triggered World War III. There was a man who was above him who was the leader of the fleet. This man. His name, I've got it written down here, it's a bit hard to pronounce, Arkhipov. The guy who wanted to fire the torpedo's name was Savitsky. And Arkhipov said, you're not going to do it, I'm in charge, we're going up, we're going to surrender. Hugh. It was that close to nuclear war. When he returned to the Soviet Union, Mr. Arkhipov, or he, I think then he was probably um, more than a captain, he was uh, maybe a commodore, became a pariah for, for surrendering. But he actually saved the world. Men's hearts failing them for fear. 
There were plenty of people in those days whose hearts were beginning to fail them for fear, for knowing what was coming upon the earth. Fear results in anxiety and prolonged anxiety results in depression. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We've already had uh, Neil Nedley mentioned this morning, uh, his program, uh, which ADRA have been helping to support in various places. And uh, Neil points out a number of causes of depression and anxiety. First of all, genetic, what you inherit. Well, you can't do anything about that, I'm afraid. Developmental, what happens in your childhood and as you grow up. Your lifestyle, you know, some people get involved in lifestyles that are definitely going to cause them to move into that risk area of depression, uh, particularly drug taking and alcohol use. Nutritional, we now know that nutrition is very important with regard to A, brain development, and B, what happens to your brain as you grow older. And then thought patterns. Now, the thought patterns part is not a, a strong part of the Nedley program. I've added it in there because he does have a part of his program which does impinge on thought patterns. But we're going to look at thought patterns because thought patterns are quite important. So, the Neil Nedley program talks about diet, exercise, music, hydrotherapy, meditation and fellowship. And we'll look at all of those. First of all, some modern scientific uh, studies have told us this. This is called Mood, Food and Cognition, the role of tryptophan fan and serotonin. Now serotonin is the brain chemical that keeps you uh, happy. Tryptophan represents a key element for brain functioning because of its role as a precursor for the production of the neurotransmitter serotonin. Sorry, serotonin is the one that uh, keeps your brain happy but it's, it's a metabolite of tryptophan. And tryptophan is a food substance. You can get it through your food. Not only a diet rich in tryptophan, but also a diet rich in antioxidants can have a positive impact on mood and cognition. This could be of special relevance for individuals who present with low grade inflammation conditions. Now I won't go into the detail there, but uh, this is an emerging field uh, of inflammation as being a problem with a number of conditions. Some of the foods that enhance the nerve conduction, uh, the tryptophan containing foods, you can see them here, nuts and dates and oats and so on. And now I've, I've purloined this slide from uh, one of my colleagues, um, <laughs> so I hope I'll be forgiven for that. Diet, the effects of plant-based diets on the body and the brain, the systematic review, this was published in 2019, only a month ago. And what they said is, in sum, the increasing interest for plant-based diets raises the opportunity for developing novel preventive and therapeutic strategies against obesity, eating disorders and related comorbidities. Still, putative effects of plant-based diets on brain health and cognitive functions, as well as the underlying mechanisms, remain largely unexplored and new studies need to address these questions. In fact, there have been studies um, that have looked into these, um, and there will be more. One of the studies is very interesting because it talks about what lives inside you, inside your intestine. And I'll read the bottom part here. Um, when you are uh, do, ha having a plant-based diet, you actually change the bacteria that live inside your gut to bacteria that are more useful than if you were a meat eater, for example. And what this study said is, as a balanced microbial community modulated by diet uh, is a key regulator of the host physiology, it seems likely that gut microbiota, that's what's living inside you, plays a role in depression. That's interesting. Exercise. Exercise also has been shown to be very important um, in helping uh, depressive symptoms. And this is a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis means that this, um, these guys had got a hold of a whole lot of studies and put them together and they made this conclusion. Physical exercise is an effective intervention for depression. It also could be a viable adjunct treatment in combination with antidepressants. Okay. Physical exercise is very important. 
Now, let's go back 150 years. This is what Ellen White had to say. The time spent in physical exercise is not lost. A proportionate exercise of all the organs and faculties of the body is essential to the best work of each. When the brain is constantly taxed while the other organs of the living machinery are inactive, there is a loss of strength, physical and mental. The physical system is robbed of its healthful tone, the mind loses its freshness and vigour and a morbid excitability as the result. When the brain is constantly taxed without exercise, and this is a, one, another personal testimony uh, written to a person. A portion of her time should be spent out of doors in physical exercise, that she may be invigorated to do her work indoors with cheerfulness and thoroughness, being the light and blessing of the home. Clearly written to a mother. You know, um, Mothers often find themselves trapped in the home. And here she's saying, don't be trapped in the home. Get out, get some light fresh air and exercise because it will help you in your home duties. Music. Now, this is a fairly familiar theme, isn't it? In the scripture, we know that King Saul had a mental problem. And what was the solution for his mental problem? Music from David's harp. It didn't always work though, we remember on one occasion. Uh, King Saul perhaps didn't like what he was hearing and threw a spear at him. And uh, incidentally, we know there are two types of music, don't we? <laughs> but I'm sure David's music was very tuneful. Now, I'm going to prove to you that music is good for your mood. Hands up those who were at the Adra concert last week. Hands up. Okay. All right. Now, well, keep your hands up if you were there. If you didn't feel better at the end of that concert than you were at the beginning, put your hand down. <laughs> Nobody. We all felt better, didn't we? It was wonderful. And we know that music is something that eases and soothes the soul. Although there are forms of music, as we know, that can do the opposite. But music, particularly music that is designed to uplift and to bring us closer to God, is definitely going to make us feel better. And I'll prove it to you from science as well. This was a randomised controlled study of 47 elderly people. Um, so half were, had the music and half didn't. So they had music and they had those who had no music who completed the study after being recruited in Hong Kong. Blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate and depression level variables were collected. In the music group there were statistically significant decreases in depression scores. Oh, my line's gone in the wrong place there. <laughs> and blood pressure. So not only did it help the mood, it actually brings your blood pressure down as well. So those of you who are suffering from blood pressure, get some nice music. You know, go out in the outdoors, perhaps I know what you could do. Put on a pair of music headphones with some nice music, get out in the, in the fresh air and do a bit of exercise. That should work really well together, shouldn't it? And the last thing here is friendship and fellowship. Proverbs 18.24 says this, A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And having good friends is good for the soul. And this is what John had to say in his epistle. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So loving one another brings us closer to God. And Ellen White had this to say in the Adventist home. The warmth of true friendship, the love that binds heart to heart, is a foretaste of the joys of heaven. So remember what it said in Proverbs? A man who has friends must himself be friendly. You've got to make an effort. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now lastly, thought patterns. This is what Isaiah had to say. 
what God gave him to say, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. So having the mind stayed upon things of God gives perfect peace. That's what the promise is. You know, the children were asked about promises, and this is a promise that is there for them as well as us. Now, we've been talking about fear. Let's talk about the opposite of fear. Fear not. Isaiah 41.10, fear not. Why? Fear not why. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I like to think that that I is the I am. And in 2 Timothy 1.7, remember Paul was giving advice to a younger uh, pastor. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And Jesus had this to say because his disciples were troubled. They were worried about lots of things. They were worrying about what would happen in this kingdom that Jesus was promising. They were worrying about where they would be in the hierarchy. They were worrying about this and worrying about that. And Jesus sat them down and said to them this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This was the promise that was given them when they were afraid they were going to lose their master. And he said, no, I'm just going away. I'm preparing a place for you and I will come again. This is the promise that we all have. I will come again. The promise we had in the children's story. The promise that all of us have. And in 1 John 4.18 it says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And the very famous statement of Ellen White, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. And that is not just applying to the church as a whole, it applies to each one of us. We have nothing to fear for the future. Think of how the way the Lord has led you. Think of why you are here, sitting here today. It's because the Lord has led you in the past. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we need to understand history. We need to understand our own history. We need to understand the history that you have given us of your people in order to understand the future. Because you have given us so many promises about the future which are based on how you have led us in the past. And we pray, Lord, that you will ever keep that before us, that we will remember the way you have led us in the past, that we will use that to drive us into the future, a future where you have promised that you will come again. May that be the prayer of each one of our hearts today, we ask in your name. Amen.